We know that the children are the future. Through good, local, public education, we can prepare Connecticut students for the economy and jobs to help our state grow. But the question that remains is, what is the future of Connecticut schools? With issues like underperforming HVAC systems and teacher shortages after the pandemic, we must ask how we can best maintain the high quality of our public education system. Joining us for the second time in the Municipal Voice is Patrice McCarthy, now the Executive Director of the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, to discuss their core issues and more. We'd like to thank our sponsors at Gateway and Housatonic Community Colleges. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Commerce of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or member municipal leaders. Patrice, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Um, so a little over a year ago, you uh, came on the municipal, the municipal Voice. So welcome back. Good to have you again. Always um, good to be here. For our viewers who might not have seen that episode or might not remember, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education and what you do? Absolutely. CAPE is a nonprofit membership association. We provide education, advocacy, and support for boards of education. We provide very similar services to school boards as CCM provides to municipalities. So we are helping our board members advocate at the state and federal level. We're providing them with professional development opportunities. And then we provide a number of individualized services to help boards be strong governing bodies. Interesting. Um, and I know you were recently made the executive director of the association. Um, can you tell us a bit about what your role is and how your goals are, what your goals as the director are um, leading an organization like CABE? It's, it's been a wonderful professional journey. I actually began my career at the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, mm -hmm. but I've spent most of my professional life working with school boards and mm -hmm. now to have the opportunity to lead the association, particularly in these very challenging times for public education is exciting. We have a very strong staff and board of directors, and they are very committed to helping school boards navigate these issues that they are facing, everything from funding to concerns about curriculum to maintaining civility mm -hmm. at public meetings, and we help them navigate that course. So it's an exciting time to be in this role. Definitely sounds like it. So I know one of the biggest uh, stories that we want to cover, and we talked about this a little bit last time you were on, but the uh, HVAC issues in our public schools seems might seem kind of obvious from the outset, but can you tell us why it's important for our public school buildings to have properly maintained and working HVAC systems? Well, certainly the pandemic has highlighted the yeah. importance of indoor air quality, and there is a, a renewed focus. Districts did extensive measures at the beginning of the pandemic as they were making plans to bring students and staff back into their buildings. Mm -hmm. But some of those solutions were really temporary fixes. Uh, they are now looking at the long-term HVAC needs. And we're fortunate that there are some state funds available to support districts, but we know the cost is very significant yeah. to add uh, air conditioning to buildings that are 50 years old that are made of cinder blocks mm -hmm. is a very expensive undertaking. So yeah. we're actually delighted to be working with CCM and with CAPS to make clear to the legislators and uh, the administration that this need is going to be an ongoing need. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned just now, this isn't um, just about you know, the COVID and that kind of stuff. Like I said, there's some of these older buildings that don't even have air conditioning in them yet. Absolutely. Most of our school buildings do not have air conditioning at this point. Yeah. So most of the, these issues predated the, the pandemic. The pandemic just brought them more to the news front, I would guess. Absolutely. Recently, uh, the Go Governor Lamont announced $150 million for HVAC improvements across the state. Uh, is this going to be enough? No, it definitely is not going to be enough. We know individual districts that have had studies done that show that just for the schools, and this would be a medium-sized suburban district, just for their schools, it would cost $30 million. So we know that there will need to be ongoing appropriations to meet this need. Yeah. And districts need time. They need to be able to have the studies done as to what the appropriate changes 
would be. And also it's hard to get contractors. It's hard to get supplies right now. Yeah. Now you mentioned the need for time. I know a recent uh, CT Mirror article called this funding temporary because it's set to expire in 2025. But of course, towns and cities are going to be struggling with the issue of HVA systems that need maintenance, repair, regardless of you know any kind of deadlines. What would the ideal reform that the state could make to improve air conditions for our children? Well, I think that the funding support is critical and making mm -hmm. sure that that is available over an extended period of time so that we can have the opportunity to make sure all of our schools are brought up to those current standards. Yeah. Touch on something else. Another story that came out recently was that New Haven had adopted a new policy on LGBTQ plus kids. Um, they had based it on work that CABE had done and uh, revised in the wake of new legislation that outlawed discrimination based on gender identity. A majority of towns and cities have not adopted policies based on CAVE's work, but do you think that over time this will become the norm? I, I do, and policy adoption is a labor-intensive process at the local level. So there are new mandates every year from the legislature for new policies, and it's, it's a year-round process that boards undertake in order to comply with the new requirements as well as review their existing policies. School board members are very committed to making sure that all of the students in their buildings feel safe and welcomed, and this is a part of that. Why was it important for CAVE to get these recommendations out there now, kind of at a time even before it was going to necessarily be adopted on a broad basis? We are seeing that the uh, needs of our students who have in some cases been marginalized are very mm -hmm. significant. These This is a student population that is more likely to attempt to commit suicide. And so there really is a focus on the populations that are most vulnerable in our schools and making sure that we recognize them and that we in, do all we can to ensure their safety. Yeah, and talking about safety, it really, it becomes a, a health issue and you know it could even be saving lives if we're being honest about it. Absolutely. So that reaches the question of how CAVE advocates on behalf of boards of education and children. These funds could not have been made available without work of organizations like yours and CCM. Uh, how do you set your priorities year in and year out? Well, actually, we have our annual delegate assembly that's coming up in conjunction with the CAVE CAPS convention in November. And that sets the overall positions of the association. Mm -hmm. We then have a state relations committee where board members come together and identify usually five to six legislative priorities that we will mm -hmm. be pursuing, recognizing that there will be a host of other education issues that we need to address. But that's the committee that really says these are the top priority for school boards in the upcoming legislative session. Yeah. Um, and what what were your priorities for this this year? Funding is always at the top of the list, mm -hmm. without a doubt, uh, both the ensuring appropriate funding for the ECS formula, as well as the special education excess cost grant. Mm. The fact that for many years that grant was capped has a significant impact on local budgets because yeah. those are costs that are beyond the control of a school mm -hmm. board because they are driven by services that students really need. Yeah, And there's a federal and a state obligation to meet the needs of our special education students. And that yeah. comes with a price tag. Yeah. So obviously we want to help out those kids. But when when one kid moves from one small town, especially to another or into a small town, that can vastly affect the budget. Absolutely. Another priority is always a raising a concern about any new, particularly unfunded mandates, just yeah. like CCM's concerns. We know that decisions for education are best made at the local level. Yeah. And when the legislature is overly prescriptive, that inhibits the ability of school districts to meet the needs of their students. So this might be a kind of a broad question, but what are some things that you wish the general public or even some incoming representatives uh, knew about our boards of education and how they're run? Well, I think it's very important for everyone to know that in Connecticut, our school board members are all volunteers. They receive no compensation. And it's very important that they have the opportunity to engage in professional development so that they understand their roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. and that they work to be an effective leadership team with their superintendent. 
It's also important for people to know that individual school board members have no power. So the school board member that's your neighbor or that mm-hmm. you see at the grocery store and that you raise a concern about something happening in the schools, that individual can't make that change. They can't yeah. change your child's school bus stop. They can't change the start time of our high schools. They have to work together as a leadership team, as a governing body, and set policy for the district. And they do that mm-hmm. when they come together in a legally constituted meeting. Yeah. So you shouldn't go to your neighbor who's on the board and say, you got to do this right now. But if you talk with them about issues, they certainly would be someone that could bring it up at those meetings to talk to the other board members. Exactly. And they can also help guide members of the public as to mm. what are the appropriate channels that you need to go through. If yeah. You're concerned about something happening in your child's classroom. Mm. You begin by talking to the classroom teacher. If mm-hmm. the issue isn't resolved, you go to the building principal. So there is a process and school board members, when they become elected to the board, they develop an understanding of the process yeah. so they can be ambassadors to their community and help their community in that way. That, that's cool to think about. They can help inform the public because it is very complicated, all the rules and how things work. And most of us don't understand it, especially if we don't have kids that are in school right now. That's right. This brings us uh, kind of to our next question. What is the relationship between boards and the other parts of government, um, ones we're primarily concerned with, with towns and cities? What is the relationship between boards and towns like? Well, in Connecticut, unlike many other states, boards of education are not fiscally independent. They are dependent upon the municipality for their budget. So that's one area where it's critically important that boards and municipalities work well together. Mm -hmm. And of course, given that my background includes both working with municipalities and boards of education, I am particularly focused on making sure that those relationships are Mm -hmm. developed, that those relationships are strong, and that there's good communication. We recently participated with CCM and did a joint webinar for board members and municipal officials Mm -hmm. about conducting meetings in this time of great um, instability, shall we say, Mm -hmm. and how to make that an effective process so that members of the community can be heard and public bodies can get their business done. Yeah. And is the way we do things in Connecticut unique? Is it kind of the standard across the other states? How, How do we stack up? Uh, The fact that boards of education in Connecticut do not have taxing authority is fairly unique around the country. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. Notably, there's some difficulties when coming up with budgets for boards of ed, and those are directly reflected then into the property tax, um, something CCM has been trying to mollify for years. From CAVE's angle, what can be done to help lower the burden on the property tax without diminishing the quality of our schools? We definitely need more state support for our public schools. And that goes back to issues such as the funding of the excess cost grant for special Mm -hmm. education costs. The cap should be removed from that grant. It should be fully funded on a permanent basis. And that would alleviate a lot of the stress that individual municipalities and therefore boards of education face around funding. There certainly has also been a significant effort in recent years to look at shared services. How can we provide the same programs, but perhaps provide them in a more cost-effective manner? So boards and municipalities sharing services, such as a joint finance director, Mm -hmm. uh, buildings and grounds services, as well as boards looking to other school boards in the area and having some arrangements there where programs are actually shared or staff is shared. Now, is that sharing stuff that you're working on now, or do you need the legislature to make some changes to allow some of that stuff to happen? It really depends upon relationships. It's not Mm -hmm. an area where there's a need for specific legislative action. Okay. But building those relationships so that people trust each other mm-hmm. and are able to have a discussion about what would make sense for their communities or, in the case of a board and a municipality. Um, so we have something exciting coming up over here at CCM. We're having our big annual convention uh, come up on November 1st. Um, and at that convention, we're holding a the final and only televised gubernatorial debate in Connecticut uh, for this election cycle. 
Um, for Connecticut schools and for our children, what would you like to hear uh, from the candidates at this debate? I would love them to emphasize the importance of supporting the needs of all of our students and to acknowledge the state role that funding is an important component of that support. And also to recognize the volunteer nature of our governing bodies for our public schools, that these are people from the community, that they have the best interests of the community and the students and the staff, and that they are working hard to make the decisions that will make sure that we can provide an effective education, reduce the achievement gaps that we see, and make sure that the all of the needs, both academic as well as social and emotional needs, are met. Well, let's hope they do talk about some of that stuff. Uh, November 1st at 7 o'clock. So the theme of our convention this year is actually getting back to the future of Connecticut. Um, kind of kind of after a few years with the pandemic feeling like, you know, we were just going from putting out one fire to the next with all, you know, dealing with things on hand. We're finally getting to a place where we can kind of look forward and start making long term plans again. What does the future look like for boards of education in Connecticut for our public schools and for our children? Are you feeling optimistic about it? I, I am. Our, our students are definitely our future. And we have had a number of opportunities to interact with students. We actually had two students participate in our summer leadership conference and they were so terrific and had such a wonderful message that we're bringing them back for our annual conference in mid-November. The passion that our students bring to not only their academics, but their concern for the welfare of everyone mm -hmm. in their school community, their peers, as well as the staff in the building is really extraordinary. There are so many bright, articulate, passionate young people in our schools that that's what motivates school board members. It's what motivates the K board of directors and staff to do the best we can to support them because they really are our future. Yeah, we should all do our best to help out the kids of Connecticut. Well, Patrice McCarthy, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. We'd like to thank our guest, Patrice McCarthy. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry draws on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page.